Hello there and welcome back to the channel. Today's video was planned to be a tutorial on how to fix the GPS issues some people are facing when using their quads with Avatar HD. These issues aren't particularly unusual in the sense of whilst DJI FPV has been playing well with GPS, HD0 has been known to cause problems and Avatar is behaving the same, causing wipeouts and GPS not to work at all. The plan was to walk you through all of the steps you can do to get the GPS working. However, this video has ended up being a bit of a journey and in the end, I still haven't actually solved the problem, but there is so much good information in here, I decided to publish the video anyway. You are going to follow me through a journey of trialing things step by step, and we're going to take a look on the Spectrum Analyzer at what is actually causing the problems as well. But I can say at this point in the end, whilst I have found ways of improving it, there is no out and out single solution to solving the problem other than additional separation, and we will discuss that a little bit more later on in the video. Now, just before I jump into it, I just want to say, if you find this video interesting, please do make sure you give the video a like. If you'd like to support us, please do check out the links to my Patreon in the description. Anyway, let's get on with it and let's take a look at what this is all about. So here is my Avatar HD build. We have a May Texas GPS hanging out on the back. We have my Avatar VTX in the middle and my flight controller here. Now, ever since I've done this build, I have not been able to get GPS to behave properly at all. I have a virtual identical build with DJI with a Vista and it works absolutely fine. Yet with this, it just will not play ball. I've done a huge amount of investigation and there's nothing particularly untoward going on with the Avatar VTX from the point of an RF side of things. It really is the case that whatever clocks and oscillators are on board are causing problems with the GPS. There's nothing specifically in the L1 band. It's just the onboard VTX is noisy and the only real solution has been to actually move the GPS further away from the VTX. However, that isn't always ideal to do. Now, my setup on this one is the GPS on the back with the wiring going over the top and actually underneath the VTX, and then it comes up and goes into the flight controller. The reason I have it going under the VTX is I have all the VTX wiring going over the top as well as the receiver, and I wanted to make sure that I had that out the way as much as possible. However, it is still causing problems. Now, before I've actually done what we're going to do today, I have done some other testing and I can actually get the GPS to sort of behave if I power my flight controller first of all, allow the GPS to get sat lock and then power the aircraft up via the battery. However, as soon as I do power it up by the battery, I actually start to lose sats and I get problems in flight. And again, it's still not working correctly. Now, before we move into the rest of the video, I just want to demonstrate to you what the actual issue is that's causing the problems with the GPS. Here we have an Avatar VTX. This is my test one. My goggles are turned on in the corner. And this here is a very high gain antenna for my spectrum analyzer. I'm just going to place it back off screen there, showing you about eight centimeters to 10 centimeters of separation. If we now hop over to the desktop, you can see my spectrum analysis display from the analyzer, and we've currently got it set to the GPS L1 public band. At the moment, the VTX is not powered up. These little spikes you can see here is noise that I'm picking up in my current location. Now, the noise floor here is running at about minus 110 dB, inside my workshop. GPS signals are not like traditional signals where you would see a large spike on the display like you see with the OFDM video. They are very, very weak signals which actually tend to sit in the minus 130 to 110 dB area. There's some very special clever algorithms used in GPS to separate out those GPS signals from the noise in the background to allow your receiver to pick up the satellite signals. Now, the problem that Avatar is causing with GPS is that it's not putting large carriers on the band, it's that it's actually increasing the overall noise floor, and we'll demonstrate that now in a moment. 
If you notice, as I've shown, we've got our noise floor at about minus 110 dB, and you can see that with the white area at the top here. If I just reach over and power on the VTX, I'm just going to power it up. You will see some spikes and noise appear on the band and then vanish. But what you will then note is that the overall noise level on the band has increased substantially. You can see now that we're up to sort of minus 98, 99, 100 dBm. We've definitely increased the amount of noise on the band that the spectrum analyzer is picking up. And this is what is causing the problems with your GPS module. It's not that it's putting large carriers, it's just making more noise and the GPS receiver can't hear the GPS satellite speaking to it. If I just grab my antenna and move it back probably another 10 centimeters, just to demonstrate that, I've just left go, that's where you saw it dip on the display. You can see whilst the signal level has dropped a little, it hasn't changed a lot and it is clear that the VTX is creating quite a bit of noise on the band. If I now just reach over and turn the power off, there you go, you will see instantly that that noise level has dropped and we're now back to that more traditional minus 105, 110 dB area. So that is what is causing the problems. The VTX, the MIPI connection, the camera, the whole system is just adding increased noise, bringing up that noise floor, meaning that your GPS receiver is simply being drowned out. Now, Walksnail have suggested something you can do to help improve GPS performance with their VTX, and that is to ground their heat sinks. If you look in here, you can see my VTX is actually held in place with this little rubber pad, and I've got it into a DJI mount. But what they're recommending is you actually manually ground the top and bottom heat sink that's attached to the VTX by scraping off some of the paint, putting a bolt through, and then connecting a wire to that. Just to show you that on this one here, this is my testing one, you can see that we've got the heat sink on the top and the heat sink on the bottom. And what they're actually suggesting is you scrape off some of the paint on the top here, some of the paint underneath it, and then put a bolt through and make sure you put a ground wire to that bolt, making sure that you've got a good connection to earth. Now, I've actually done some checks on this one and let me grab my trusty old multimeter and I'll actually show you this and I've done no modifications to this already. However, my VTX heatsink on this one is already grounded. It does have a good ground and it doesn't appear to need any additional grounding at all. If we just check, I'm in beep mode, and if I go into the negative terminal on the battery strap, and if I go onto the VTX this side here, you can hear that that is beeping. I'm there going onto the antenna connections. If I just go onto the top of the VTX and scrape it in a little bit through the paint, there you go. You can see, let me just scrape it there, that I'm getting less than an ohm. Let me bring that in a bit more so you can see it on the top. Let me just give a push. There you go. 4 ohm, 3 ohm. If I scrape into the paint, I can get it to naught. And if I just now check on the bottom heat sink, I can just get to the side here, and I'm going to need to scrape into the paint a little bit. Just make sure I get in the right position. It's not as easy to get to on mine as it should be. There we go. And if I check it now, what's interesting is the bottom one isn't grounded. So whereas the top one clearly is, the bottom one clearly isn't. And that is why Walksnail are recommending you manually ground your VTX to make sure that both sides are grounded and both sides are then offering the best possible protection. So the first thing I'm going to do is get a bolt through that and we're going to ground that VTX and see what improvement it makes. Okay, so I've got my VTX out now, so it's a bit easier to get to. And what we'll do is we'll just test this again. So I'm going to go on to the negative of my battery terminal and we're going to check on the top heat sink, putting a bit of pressure just to get through the paint. 
it's definitely grounded i'm just trying to scrape in there we go yeah definitely grounded and i've already scraped some paint here off the bottom one and if we check that absolutely nothing if i go on the metal bit which goes over the top of the mippy cable no nothing at all so what is clear at this point is the top heat sink is grounded the bottom heat sink isn't now walk snail have a recommendation to solve this which is sand off or remove a bit of the paint on either side where the, one of the bolt holes is and then pop a bolt through so you're grounding both sides of the vtx you can do this with just a normal bolt a little m1.6 like i've got here if you've got your vtx bolted into the frame already the chances are you're going to find that it is already grounded but do check it first so what i'm going to do is get myself a phillips screwdriver and i'm just going to remove some of the paint around the edge of that bolt hole there you can do this with a bit of sandpaper or something like that you just want something just to ensure that when you bolt it down actually i'm not going to do it on that one and i tell you why because any bolt i put on that one is going to go over the mippy connection sorry the antenna ufl connection um and prevent me getting that off if i need to make a change in the future so i'm actually going to do it on this front one here that way it's not going to cause me any problems if i want to do it so i've just done that to remove some of the paint there i'm going to do the same on this side you can use a file you can use just a screwdriver just something to mark it up a little bit i'm also just going to get in there with a bit of sandpaper and just rough that up just so when i put the bolt in place we know it's going to be grounded not quite got it where i want it a second let's do this side first this side's a bit easier because it's a flat area so i can as I tighten the bolt down, it should bite anyway. So I'm fairly happy with that. So what we're going to do is pop the bolt through. And then go into place him on the top. I have also removed a bit of the sort of coating off the top of the bolt as well. Now this is a Phillips nut and bolt. So we'll be able to tighten this one up. Okay, so I've bolted that down quite tightly. So let's now do some tests and see if we've got it. So if we go on the bottom, there we go. You can instantly see that the bottom heat sink is now grounded as well as the top one. There we are so we've got a nice connection now so now we've got it through and that should offer the best grounding now for the vtx and we can now see if that helps with the gps performance okay so we've just done a straight cold boot overlooking the uh, hedge there and we'll just wait a second and see what happens with regards to the gps now for some reason my hdmi cable is playing up again on the avatar it does do this from time to time we'll watch the sat count at the top and we'll see if anything kicks in if it doesn't what we'll do is we'll hop over to beta flight i'll plug it in the usb as well and see if it actually kicks in or not so it's a few minutes later and as you can see we're still flashing zero which means we've seen no improvement by grounding both sides of the vtx unfortunately this has been the experience of most people whilst i think it has helped for one or two in the majority of cases grounding the other side of the vtx itself really hasn't done anything now just to demonstrate if it made any difference on the spectrum analyzer as well i've got that bench vtx here it's bolted through here and it's bolted through in this corner the opposite way as well i've tested it with the multimeter it's all shielded it's all shielded and earth through the main negative terminal so what we'll do again is get our antenna you can see it there i'll just pop it about that far away and then we'll hop over to the analyzer screen okay so we're on l1 again you can see we've got our noise floor around the same area minus 105 to 110 db i'm just going to power up the vtx we'll wait for it to finish kicking in as always it puts a bit of noise on the band as it's booting up but we can then see if there's any change in the overall noise floor. 
Now, looking at it here, it is clear that there is much less noise with the VTX on and it has reduced the amount of noise that is getting out simply by putting bolts through, clamping that heatsink down and making sure that it is earthed. However, this has not been enough in this situation to actually stop it interfering. And if I now turn the VTX back off, you'll see that it does again step down. So it is clearly still having an effect. So the next thing we're going to do is something a bit more drastic, and that is try to shield the cables from our flight controller to our GPS module. Now, this is something Albert Kim has shown recently. I was actually working on this video pretty much the same time as he had already published his. However, I'm going to show you it in the specific context of this Avatar HD. Now the idea of shielding your wiring is to ensure that there's no interference being picked up from other parts of the system. There is no guarantee that this is going to help but what we will do is do it in this case and test it and see if it actually makes an improvement here. Now to do this you're going to need some stuff so what I'm going to do is hop over and show you the process on a straight piece of wire first of all and then we will come back and do it on here. Okay, so what I've got here is a GPS wire off one of my planes. I'm going to do this shielding on this first, and then I'll actually do it on my quad, and we'll take a look at what the results actually look like there. Now, to do this, there are some things you're going to need. The first thing is some copper foil tape. Now, I bought this off Amazon. It's sold as used for repelling slugs and things like that. It is proper copper. It is single-sided, so it's not double-sided tape and it is a 10 mil wide tape which is ideal for what we need here. You're also then going to need something to cover it. Now I'm using this cloth tape. I use this all the time as you can see I've used quite a bit off this reel already but you could use insulation tape but you need something to cover this because once you have put this on your wire it is then going to be conductive externally and you need to make sure that it isn't going to touch anything and blow that so you're going to need to wrap it and we're going to use that. Now, there is something you're going to need to do before you actually wrap the copper, and that is attach a wire. Because it isn't enough to just wrap the tape around the wire, you actually need to make sure that that tape is grounded as well. So I've got a small piece of wire here which we'll use, and we can actually solder directly to this copper tape, and we'll take a look at doing that in a moment. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually unstick a piece and cut off a length for doing this. Now I'm not going to shield the whole thing, I'm just going to do a length just probably down to about there. So what I'm going to do is cut it roughly there with my blade and then that will be ideal. Now before we do anything else we're going to need to solder our wire to this before we put it on because you don't want to solder to it after you've wrapped it around your existing wiring because you have the potential to actually cause damage and melt it if you were to do that. So what I'm going to do is get my portable soldering iron in place and ready to go. We're going to just plug that in. This is the Squire soldering iron. It isn't the one I use every day. I traditionally use a bench style iron however it is ideal for doing things like this and showing you guys here as well so we're just going to turn that on and wait for that to warm up and then what we'll do is we're just going to pop that tape there we'll tin a little bit of it down here in the corner so we'll just check what my iron's got up to there we go it's heating up there we are so what I'm going to do then is simply just tin a little bit here and because it is copper it will tin no problem at all and then I'm simply going to rotate it so my hands in the right place and then tack on this little bit of wire down here here we go perfect so once we've then wrapped that around our wire, we can then use that to actually ground the shielding to make sure that we're getting the best possible effect. So now that's done, you can then see that that's tacked on there at the bottom. And then we can now actually start working our way back up. Now, 
I'm only going to do from there, as I've said, just to demonstrate a normal sort of GPS wire length that we would have in FPV. I'm not going to go and do the whole thing. So what I will do is peel this back. I'm going to start it with this end here so I can just wrap that around like that and then fold that in. Being careful not to tear it. If you do tear it, it's not end of the world because it is conductive and you can just stick it back over the top of itself and it will actually stick. I have torn it a little bit there, but it's not fully. So we're not going to worry about that. It is still attached. So we'll wrap him around, covering the wire all the way up as we move around. And the easiest way to do this is just to keep rotating up the wire as we move on up the length. Let me just unstick it from itself there. It's quite sticky, this stuff. There we go. And then I'm just going to twist and rotate, move up the wiring as we go around, making sure that we've completely covered it. I haven't quite cut a left there, but I'm not worried about that. That leaves us just a nice little bit at the end there to actually go into my GPS module. But you can see then the bulk of it has now been done. If I wanted to, I could just put another little bit on if I needed to. We can just cut it and I'll actually show you with the multimeter that it is conductive. You can add to it if you need to. If we wanted to just make sure that we did get that little bit up there, absolutely 100%. There we go. And then we'll just wrap that around making sure we don't go too close to the plug. You don't want to go all the way up to the end because you do need to be careful that you don't actually short the connections there. But you can now see that we've wrapped that all the way around, all the way up the wire. And if I just grab my multimeter, we can then actually just check the continuity of this just to demonstrate this for you. You can see we've got our continuity here to here and that's on the new little bit I wrapped around it. So you can wrap it over the top. It'll absolutely be fine. But if I then go to the end up here and then to my little wire, it's just, let me just put my finger on it. There we go. Absolutely fine. A hundred percent conductive. So now that we've done this, the next thing we want to do is wrap it so it can't actually touch anything in our frame and we want to make sure that we do this so it's not going to catch anything or short anything out because this tape is extremely conductive and it would very easily short something out if you were not careful so again it's exactly the same process just wrapping the tape around as i said you could do this with insulation tape if you wanted to i personally prefer the cloth tape i use this cloth tape quite a bit on things i build on the bench it's very handy to have for doing stuff and there we are and then what i would do then is just add a little bit to the end there just to make sure that that is on and sealed just pulling it a bit tighter you could also use something like self amalgamating tape if you wanted to too and you can see up this end we've just got a little bit that isn't done there so again i'm just going to take a piece and wrap it and just make sure that we've got it nicely covered we go get rid of any stray threads cut them off or give them a pull there we are and there that is it it is done it is shielded and that way 
it's going to keep as much of any noise, any RF or anything else out of the wire as much as you can. You want to be leaving yourself a good sort of inch before the flight controller and then a little bit up here. Again, not getting too close to the plug on this side here. It does make it nice and stiff and it actually stays where you leave it as well because of that copper foil. And then all we would need to do is if this was our main GPS cable is solder that onto our flight controller as normal and then ground that out as well. So onto our ground wire to make sure that we've actually earthed the cable all the way up. So what I'm going to do now is actually do this process on my avatar quad. Okay, so as you can see, we've got that wire now shielded, covered in copper all the way up. There's no gaps. Again, we've left a little bit of a gap at the top here because we don't want to get in too close to those connections there. It's all wrapped nicely. And then I've got my little wire coming out the bottom here, which we will attach to ground, which will actually ground up this as well. So what we'll do now is get it wrapped in tape to make sure that it's not going to cause any damage to anything, get the wire soldered up, get it all back in place, and then see how it actually performs. Okay, so that's all done. Now, just before we route it, I just want to make sure that we do have it grounded. So I'm just going to go onto the ground pad there, which is on the battery strap. And there is a bit of ground showing there. I left a bit exposed. There we go. Absolutely fine. So we now need to simply route the wire correctly and then get it connected and test it and see how it performs. Okay, so I've done the routing and we've got the cable now going over the top to the GPS at the back. Rather than stick it underneath, I decided to go over the top simply because it's all a bit thicker with that copper tape on. That in itself won't improve things. I did actually try moving the wiring around before even making this video and it didn't change it. But I just thought I'd show that for the purposes of this video. Anyway, let's get it back outside and let's see how it performs. Okay, so we've powered it back up in the same location and we're just waiting now to see what happens. It's been turned on about 10 seconds. So let's see if this makes any improvement. So nothing has changed. What we're going to do now is hook into Beta Flight and actually look at what's going on under the GPS tab. As I was hooking up my USB cable, I went out and come back in and I can now see that it's gone to five sats. So it has actually started to get a lock. Oh, there we go. So we now finally have a sat lock. Now that took a bit longer than I was expecting, if I'm honest. However, I have not been able to get sat lock with this quad since installing the avatar system. So it is possible that the GPS needed to download all of the Almanac data and all of the Emphorilis data as well. What we will then do, I think, is give it a couple of minutes to settle down and we'll do a hot start and see how it behaves there because after making the changes before it wouldn't improve. So let's go and do a warm start and see how it behaves. So what we'll do is go and unplug. There we go, we've warm started and it does look like it's come back to straight lock again. There we go. It does look like it's kicked straight back in as it should do. So it's a good sign that this has improved things. Next, I need to take it for a flight. Okay, so it's now time to test if this copper foil around the GPS wiring has actually worked in the real world. We'll get it down, we'll plug the battery in and we'll see how long it takes to kick in. Okay, so the goggles are on. Now we're going to plug in the power and then I will tell you guys when I actually see that kicking on the OSD. Just need to make sure that that XT60 is in properly. There we go. We've got everything out the way. So let's see what it does. Okay, so we're still flashing at this moment in time. No sats, but we'll wait. 
and we'll see if it actually kicks in. Now, when I did this at home, it did take a few minutes, but it did actually kick in. I've put a fully charged battery on, so the situation is going to be the same here. Still zero. Still waiting. Okay, so I'm nearly four minutes in on this recording and we were already recording for over a minute just now and still nothing. So what I think I'm going to do is fly and let's see if it kicks in in the air and we'll go from there. Now, after a few flights, I did actually get it to lock again. When you saw it lock at home, it took some time and it did the same thing on the beach after a flight. It did kick in, but it wasn't reliable. It would lock, it would unlock, and it certainly isn't reliable to be able to use it for GPS rescue. Since then, I've tried a few other things. I've changed the antennas to see if that makes a difference, and it hasn't. And whilst shielding that GPS cable definitely has had an impact, it still hasn't solved the problem completely. Okay, so in the end, the situation is this. There is no one fix-all solution for every person. You can absolutely improve the performance of the VTX from a noise point of view by making sure that you've grounded both sides by bolting that heatsink down. And I have verified on the spectrum analyzer that works, but it doesn't solve the problem completely. Shielding the cables from the VTX didn't have any great effect on mine, and there's no effect on the spectrum analysis look at that either. It simply looks exactly the same. In the end, the only solution that will work guaranteed is more separation between the GPS and the VTX. Having the GPS within the area of the antennas and the VTX is just going to give you problems on this system. Two to three inches of separation improves things dramatically and moving the GPS up front should solve it completely. It's hard to say this fault is out and out caused by Avatar HD because we do see it on some HD0 VDXs as well, including the Freestyle 1 Watt. It is a combination issue, in my opinion, of GPS modules having poor shielding and VTX modules having poor shielding as well. If there was better shielding all around, then we would see less problems. But it is fair to say that the DJI system is much less noisy overall, and that means that there is more VTX manufacturers can do to help improve things to allow them to work with our GPS modules, hopefully better in the future. Here and now, this one for me still remains a problem. If I actually power the flight controller and power the GPS first, it can behave. You can actually get the GPS mate from ViFly that allows you to do this. It can help, but it doesn't solve the problem completely. Whilst this will start to pick up sats in flight, it isn't reliable and it certainly isn't reliable enough for me to trust for rescue. So, if you're having problems, you can try these things, but in the end, if none of them work, your only best option is to move the GPS up to the front of the aircraft out of the way. Now, that's it from me on this video. I hope you have found it interesting. If you have, please do consider checking out the links to my Patreon in the description. It is only with the support of my patrons am I able to keep making content on this channel, and if you think we've earned your support, please do consider checking it out. Anyway, that's it from me. Please do let me know what you think in the comment section of the video. If you have any questions, I will try and answer them. Stay safe and I will speak to you soon.